Of all desert landscapes on the planet, Chile is probably the most well known for its almighty Camanchaca fog. But here in Mexico, these desert landscapes also experience fog on a regular basis, which is vital for the survival of cacti and succulents that live in these areas. And in Peru, they call this foggy desert phenomenon Garúa. So let's explore another one of these desert ecosystems under the fog to try to discover some of the mysteries and the secrets that make it possible for these plants to survive such inhospitable environments. If it's your first time on the channel, welcome. I hope you like cacti. We make nothing but content related to cacti and succulents in both cultivation and in the wild to try to highlight the importance of their conservation. Remember, take nothing but pictures from nature. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. We are in Mexico once again. We're looking for plants like always. And we're actually looking for a dwarf cactus that I'm not going to name just in case we're not able to find it because I've already jinxed myself before and I'm not gonna do it now. But we stopped in a sort of area that looks really, really good to talk about sort of the environment that these plants experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So we're gonna stop here and maybe look around just to see, just to see, you know, you never know what you're gonna find we are in the mecca of cacti in the world. So everywhere you go, you can literally stop the car and take a look and you'll probably find something interesting. So let's go. Oh, look at that. Not even six feet away from the car and we already found the first volunteer. This little guy is about maybe two inches wide. It's a juvenile plant. It probably hasn't bloomed yet, but it's nice and chunky, so it's good to see that it's getting some good hydration. It's been very drainy these past couple of months here in Coahuila and all over Mexico. It's been an extremely wet year, and that's why we're looking for plants, because we're hoping that we can find some blooming and some doing other interesting things that they only do when it rains, you know, when, they, when it doesn't, and it's in drought. You usually have a really hard time just to find them because they get completely flat with the ground right now they're just a little bit chunky they're sticking out just a little bit and the the ground sort of feels wet to the touch um, it's been not only rainy but you're gonna see some of the shots of the surrounding fog that's all around us and it's not only fog you do get a very very small percentage of precipitation i did feel a couple of raindrops so that's why we wanted to stop here is to talk about not just the plants themselves. This is a Lophophora williamsii, by the way. I'm sure it needs no introduction. You guys already know what it is. But we wanted to talk even more so about the environment that these plants are living in right now because it's really interesting to see just how little precipitation or rain they require to absorb moisture and to survive. Even if it wasn't such a wet year like it is right now and they hadn't experienced all the rain that's been going on in the past couple of months, they would still be nice and happy and thriving just with this very, very small amount of moisture that they're able to capture from the little tiny droplets of precipitation that we've been experiencing here. So we're gonna go around and look for some more plants. I'm pretty sure we're gonna find some interesting things because we're in the middle of nowhere. And that's where you find the beautiful stuff away from, from people because unfortunately we are part of the reason why these things are disappearing. So I'm gonna take this little segue and take advantage of it and bring on my dreadful cactus poaching message because you're going to hear it in every single video that I make. Don't buy poached cacti and don't be an asshole. Don't rip these from the ground. It's not worth it. It's, there's no need for it. You can find them in cultivation. Please, please, please buy these plants from cultivation. We're going to keep looking for more. Hopefully we'll find some bigger lophophoras. And I also see some blooming agave. I know some of you guys are really into agave. I'm a little agave illiterate at the moment i'm still learning about them don't worry i'm gonna try to do my homework because i know you guys love them so we're gonna go walk around and try to find some more beautiful plants let's go besides the genetic adaptations that cacti have evolved over the years in order to survive the desert such as specialized leaves that turned into spines which are much better suited for the extremely hot weather and the production of psychoactive alkaloids which are meant to deter hungry mammals these plants have also formed invaluable bonds and alliances with other living organisms in the desert in order to cooperate and survive. One of the most important bonds for cacti in the wild is the one they form with their nurse plants. 
these nurse plants form shrubs that turn into small oases for the germination and survival of small cactus seedlings, which would not be able to withstand the full force of the desert sun until later on in their development, and therefore greatly benefit from having the light shade provided by their nurse plants. All right, we found the first big colony of Lophophora williamsi, and I'm a little, I can be a little excited about this tiny finding that I just did in the plant world. This is the first crested Lophophora that I ever find personally in the field without someone telling me where it was. So I did see another big crested Lophophora that you probably saw in one of the previous episodes. If you haven't checked it out, you should because it's a, it's a really, really nice plant. But this is the first one that I ever find without any coordinates or without any, any assistance. So it's a little bit of a milestone for me. I can be excited, right? It's, you'd be excited too. It's a baby crest. It's not that big. It's about maybe four inches wide, but it's still, it's still nice. You know, it's still cool. And this little population here looks quite healthy. They're showing a tiny little bit of stress. They have that little purple hue that you see when they're under a little bit of stress, but they're in very, very good shape. Some of the other plants that we've seen have been bitten by bugs or maybe rabbits. I'm not sure exactly what goes on here and what, what feeds on these Lophophoras. But these look very nice. One of them doesn't look so nice, <laughs> but most of them do. There's about maybe 10 individuals of Lophophora williamsi just in this very small two by two foot area, which is a very good number for Lophophora williamsi populations. I've usually found Lophophora frichii in denser populations, but never Lophophora williamsii. That's just been my experience. I'm not sure if it's just that I haven't, you know, I haven't gone far out in the middle of nowhere enough yet to find very dense populations but it may also be because they've just been poached and that's why the numbers are increasingly low. I'm sure most of you guys know these plants produce some very interesting alkaloids some of which are psychedelic in nature and for that reason a lot of people like to pull these from the earth and and you know consume them which is it's it's a shame that we can be the cause for the destruction of such a beautiful plant. But anyway, I digress. We have also found a bunch of other interesting things around here that we're going to show you. And it's, it's very fascinating to me the amount of biodiversity that you can find in such a small space here in Mexico. We have seen at least 10 different cactus species in a very, very small space here. And I'm sure that if we keep looking, we could spend the entire day just finding new things here. The Lophophoras look very, very healthy. They are showing some very nice coloring. Some of them have the, the very subtle purple hue that you want to find that means just a little bit of stress, but not too much where they're being overwhelmed by it. And they're completely exposed to the sunlight, guys. The sun, set, sun rises on the east on that side and it sets on the west over there. And we're in a valley. So you can imagine that these plants receive sunlight, direct sunlight for the entirety of the day. And some of them, these are in some sort of shade. I'm, I'm sure this nurse plant doesn't look like much right now, but these do grow out. They start growing some, some nice vegetative tissue, which is the green stuff. And that's what protects some of these from that direct sunlight. But we're going to show you some other individuals that we've seen that are 100% exposed to the sunlight. And they're doing great. And it's also interesting that right now it's 10 o'clock in the morning and there's no sun at all. And that's because there's a very thick covering of fog that we're also going to show you that I also find fascinating because I have read and I've talked to people who in cultivation actually keep these plants in total darkness for the entirety of their winter dormancy. And I always thought it was insane. I mean, how could they survive and not rot in total darkness? But now that I'm experiencing the habitat, it sort of makes sense, you know. If this is the way they live during their winter or during their dormancy, which is starting right now, I don't see why they wouldn't survive in total darkness. Now, let's have a little disclaimer here. I'm not advising any of you to put these plants in total darkness for the entirety of the winter because I honestly don't know if they would make it. I live in South Florida where it's sunny throughout most of the year and the cold season in South Florida only goes down to about 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Sometimes we reach the 40s but it's very rare. So I don't have a lot of working experience with growing these plants in extreme cold weather conditions. So 
I would never recommend you put these guys in total darkness, but some people do and now it makes total sense. I mean, the weather right now is great. It's about 60 degrees, it's nice and chilly and there's no direct sunlight. But during the summer, this is a very different scenario. These plants probably experience higher than 100 degrees Fahrenheit on a daily basis and as I said direct sunlight so it's really interesting to see how these guys are just happy to be right in the middle of nowhere in the sun and the the, the ground sort of feels a little wet it's been a lot it's been very rainy lately here in Coahuila so it's interesting that you know it's not only the cold and the darkness but they're also a little wet and damp under the soil and they're totally happy. I'm sure that if you have any of these in your collection, you know that that's a very big no-no in cultivation. Dark, cold, and damp is a death sentence for Lophophora. But we're gonna keep going. We're gonna show you some amazing things. I did see a very nice mammillaria plant on the other side of the road. So we're gonna go back there and look at that. And there's a train. I don't know if you guys heard that but we've also found some very nice agave that are blooming. So we're gonna go check them out because I'm a little agave illiterate, but I know some of you love them. So we're gonna go check them out. Although insects and mammals in the desert will sometimes take bites out of cacti and succulents, they are also responsible for their survival. Since insects will often disperse the seed of cactus plants and are also responsible for maintaining the structure of the soil around their roots, while mammals will help deposit nitrogen into the soil as they poop, a priceless nutrient for plants in general, but especially here in the desert where it's not readily available. The last partnership between cacti and succulents and other living organisms in the desert that we'll be talking about is probably the most important for the survival of these plants. And it's one that we unfortunately cannot show you because it takes place underground in the microscopic world. Unlike most other plants, cacti and succulents have the unique capability of breaking down mineral rock in order to extract the nutrients that are stored within it. This enables them to survive in places where the organic content in the soil is so extremely low that no other plants could survive. And it's all thanks to a symbiotic relationship with fungi that live on their roots and break down the mineral for them, making nutrients readily available for them to uptake. It's quite remarkable to see how each and every one of these living organisms has a vital role to play in the survival and the well-being of the entire ecosystem. And it makes you realize just how important every single species of living thing on the planet is since we're all connected and we all play a vital role in the survival of our planet. Remember, take only pictures from nature, never take the plants or the animals. All right, guys, we're gonna take advantage of these beautiful agave plants that we have here because I know some of you are very, very into these. I believe these are agave americana. Don't kill me if they're not because I am very illiterate when it comes to agave. I'm still learning about a lot of plant families. There's a ton of them and I have to do a lot of homework. But I can tell you that these plants are known as monocarpic, which means once you start seeing these beautiful bloom spikes, it's unfortunately the end of their life cycle. They have to put a tremendous amount of energy into producing such a huge inflorescence. So this is the last thing they do before they're dead. Unfortunately, they have to draw all of their energy and all of their sugars and all of their carbohydrates and build them up to be able to create such a magnificent structure. These things could be 10, even 20 feet tall. They're humongous. And the bigger the plant, well, the taller the bloom spike is going to be. These things not only produce sometimes seed, but also 
sometimes they create pups. So you'll see the huge bloom stalk and instead of flowers coming out of the top, you'll see tiny little uh, pups or smaller plants emerging from the top of the stalk. And what happens is the stalk falls over and all the little pups root on the ground and then you see how easily and how fertile they are, how readily they sort of reproduce because there's a bunch of them. And every time you see agave, you usually see a lot of them together. And this was going to be the outro to this video, but our very talented videographer actually spotted something even cooler than most of the stuff we've seen here. So we're going to leave that for the end of the video in good Steve Jobs fashion, but wait, there's more. We found these amazing seven inch wide Areocarpus retusus, and we found two of them so far. We'll probably find more, but I couldn't contain my excitement. I had to show them to you guys because these things are amazing. I mean, I am a huge Areocarpus fan. I'm sure a lot of you are as well. They're supposed to be the fastest of all the Areocarpus as, as far as growth, but they're still pretty slow growers. I'm not sure if you've seen our last, one of our past episodes where we went to Nuevo León to see some of these beauties in, in this amazing little hill that we found next to the road. But in case you haven't, go check that out. And well, here you go. These are amazing. They're huge. They're probably a, maybe 20 or 30 years old, maybe even older. But this is an amazing thing to see. I wasn't expecting to find any of your carpus plants here. So I wasn't really looking for them, you know, and when you're not looking for a distinct shape like the star for Areocarpus, it's, it's sort of harder to detect them and to see them because obviously they try to blend in with their surroundings. But I'm really happy we found them. If we find some more, we're going to shoot them for you so you guys can see them. But what an amazing way to close the episode, wouldn't you say? I hope you enjoyed this one as much as we did. It's getting cold, so we want to go get something to eat because we left the hotel in a hurry this morning. We haven't even had any food. So we'll catch you on the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this one. And if you like my t-shirt, I, I know you didn't get to see it too much because it's been under my sweater because of the cold. But if you like any of the stuff you see us wearing or you want to look for some plants, check our website, eastcoastcomanchaca.com and catch you on the next video.